Hello there and welcome to the most watched business show in the country. This is the Business Weekly Show here on City TV and I am your host Michael Obodu. Please follow me on Twitter at mobodu. In the next one hour, I'll be bringing you a wrap of all the major business news stories for the week. So if you're ready, let's go. After the many attempts by the government to implement homegrown solutions to improve the country's economic situation, it has finally begun to engage with the International Monetary Fund IMF to seek a bailout. Many stakeholders have called for the move from the start of the year, but considering the time, is it too late to salvage the economy? And what do various stakeholders make of this? The directive by President Kufado to the Finance Minister follows a telephone conversation between the President and the IMF Managing Director, Ms. Kristalina Georgieva, conveying Ghana's decision to engage the Bretton Woods Institution. According to the Information Ministry, the decision to go to the IMF was taken at a meeting on June 30, 2022. The engagement with the IMF will seek to provide balance of payment support as part of a broader effort to quicken Ghana's build back in the face of challenges induced by the COVID-19 pandemic and recently the Russia-Ukraine crisis. The move comes on the back of a multiplicity of issues affecting Ghana's economy, including a worsening public debt situation, which has risen to about 391.9 billion Ghana cities, or 78% of GDP as at March 2022, rising inflation, which has risen to about 28% in May this year, high fuel prices, city depreciation, among others. Former Finance Minister Seth Tekwe, who has been calling on government to commence discussions with the IMF, says the move is long overdue. By this time, we had analyzed that two of our expenditure lines, compensation and interest, were taking virtually all of tax revenue, which the first quarter proves clearly for this year. So I was saying, given this, uh, we might probably want to consider external assistance because a lot of external assistance had poured in through COVID. Okay, so that was my position. Now, so I was asked firmly, you know, is IMF an option? At that point, I said, yes, it's an option. But then government came in categorically and said that we were not going to go to IMF. And I said, if we are not going to go to IMF, then give us alternative. What is the alternative to the IMF? You know, that is, and so anytime I was asked, particularly for this year, I said, look, government had taken a decision that it was not going to the IMF. Okay, so what we need now is alternative. And in the absence of alternative, we are only waiting for the situation to get worse and to make the discussions, you know, more difficult. The Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, ESA, has meanwhile described government's decision to seek an IMF bailout as a step in the right direction. Speaking on the move, Director of ESA, Professor Peter Quote, noted that an IMF bailout will bring policy credibility and boost investor confidence in Ghana. That we've gotten to this stage, uh, we have no option than to look for the second best option, that is to get the IMF to help us get some credibility and also help us put our uh, house in order. So I, I, I think we've reached a stage where we ought to develop our own programs and policies that will then prepare us to engage meaningfully with the IMF. So it's not like a top-down approach where the IMF will bring us um, documents or will bring us policies to implement, but it's going to be a bottom-up approach where Ghana would have to prepare its own policies and programs that it wants the IMF to fund. We, we certainly have to stick to whatever we propose to do with the IMF. Um, whatever fiscal discipline we said we're going to do, they will help us achieve that. Um, it will also ensure that um, there will be some credibility in terms of uh, within the international space. The international community will see that, yes, there, there is indeed um, like the headmaster in the block who would ensure that we are going to do what 
um, the fiscal or the hard choices um, that we should take, but we have having difficulty achieving them. So, the yeah, IMF will bring um, some um, respite to us, but it also comes with a cost. Um, some of the uh, flagship programs and some of the um, earmarked um, expenditures will have to be trimmed down. There has to be some, some reshaping of some of these programs. So what does industry make of the move? Said Chuma Kwaba is the CEO of the Association of Ghana Industries, and he says, even though they wish we had not got into this point, we as a country do not have a choice. He believes industry needs the stability that an IMF program would bring to the economy. At some point, you don't really have much choice. It's just like if you're on a sick bed. If you're on a sick bed, it takes a bitter pill to be able to get out of the sick bed. And at this particular moment, we have challenges in the economy. And, 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 and some are internal, some are external. We all know the recent challenges we've had with the COVID pandemic and the Ukraine war and the Russian war. And maybe our own internal uh, uh, challenges and indiscipline and all that. So all have accumulated into this. So the state we've got into, um, I think that it's a good decision and a good choice to make that we need some bailout. And the bailout is necessary to give confidence back. As you rightly said, when confidence level is low, it affects speculation. People speculate into currency, people speculate into economies, people speculate into all kinds of things. And that affects our, 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 the strength of our currency and all the implications that go with it. So at this particular moment, when you are having rising costs in terms of fuel prices, rising costs in feed, rising costs in inputs, and, and so many things, then you really need some stability. And going into IMF, if it will help bring stability, why not? I think at this particular moment, what industries need is macroeconomic stability so that we can plan and predict. We can, we can have reasonable range of inflation, interest costs, and so on and so forth, so that we can do our business as normal. But at this particular moment, we are having challenges. And therefore, it is just proper that government intervene and comes up with some uh, uh, policy solutions. And if the solution is going to IMF, why not? I think we should embrace it and, and welcome it. One of the policies the government hoped to leverage on to improve the economy was the electronic transfer levy. But it doesn't seem to have met the government's expectations as the revenue raise has been just about 10% of its target. Based on its performance, some think the levy must be scrapped. The e-levy, which was amended from 1.75% to 1.5% on Tuesday, March 29, 2022, is a tax on electronic transactions on multiple platforms, including mobile money payments, among others. The government had hoped to raking about 7 billion Ghana cities from the collection of the levy, but the figure was revised downwards to about 4.2 billion Ghana cities. Despite the revised targets set for the e-levy, the delayed passage of the levy's bill into law, along with efforts by some sections of the public to not pay the tax is expected to affect the amount that will be collected by government this year. In a recent post on Twitter, a leading member of the New Patriotic Party, Gabi Asaira Chudaku, noted that the levy has been delivering only 10% of estimated revenue following its implementation, a remark that has received strong reactions from the minority in parliament as well as from some economists. Speaking on the e-levy in a recent virtual forum on the state of the Ghanaian economy, former finance minister said Tekbe downplayed the expected impact of the e-levy. The e-levy, I think I pointed it out that the e-levy is already in the budget. So one, it was not going to make a difference to the deficit that was computed unless the e-levy overperforms. I think the e-levy is overhyped, is over, you know, and it's not going to assign for correction, uh, but we wait to see because it was delayed. The other reason is that it was delayed, you know, January to May. So it may not yield as much for this year, but maybe for next year, you know, and, and, and all that. On his part, economist Professor Godfrey Bobking called for the e-levy to be withdrawn. The government should withdraw it. Do you know why I'm saying so? Um, we do recognize that our tax effort is low. The way to prop it up is not through e-levy. There are too many uh, layers of indirect taxes that all put together contribute to the high productive cost base of doing business in Ghana that makes the private sector uncompetitive 
uncompetitive. That undermines household saving capacity. That is a fact. But when it comes to progressive tax collection handles, that is where we have not done well. And the way to, to, to improve that, it's not through e-levy. Let me tell you something. You see, the evidence we are getting from the ground is that the average Ghanaian is developing coping strategies to offset that tax burden. So, so people are finding alternatives. People are reducing the number of the frequency and volume of Momo transactions. This is not good. For tax analyst Francis Timor Boy, if things don't drastically improve in three to four months with regards to the proceeds collected from the e-levy, it is likely to be withdrawn from the system. If things don't change the way they are, I think that e-levy is clearly going to be classified as a nuisance tax. And when we say nuisance tax, it's a tax that is um, collected across wider consumer base, but then the amount is very small. So if we are anticipating that it will bring us 4.2 billion, but then at the end of the day, we are just about collecting less than 300 million, then there's no need to keep it. You have to withdraw it because it doesn't achieve its purpose. Uh, aside the nuisance you are causing to consumers, you better stand the chance of withdrawing it so that you end their sympathy. If we are unable to increase performance to let's say 60, 70 percent, I see or I think that e levy stands a chance of being withdrawn. The levy isn't meeting revenue targets, but it is also affecting the operations of some businesses as well. The Ghana Association of Savings and Loans Companies is lamenting the impact of the electronic transfer levy on its operations. According to the group, there has been a significant drop in the level of transactions. They want a review of the e-levy to address their concerns. The Ghana Association of Savings and Loans Companies had earlier appealed to the Finance Ministry to exempt its members from the 1.5% payment on loans through mobile money for the reason that the electronic transfer levy will put extra financial burden on its customers and discourage businesses and individuals from borrowing from savings and loans companies. This has, however, fallen on deaf ears. Speaking to City Business News at the association's 12th annual general meeting, board chairman Kwame Ousu Boating lamented the impact of the e-levy on its operations. We all are aware of the data that has come um, from, from the national um, uh, level on, on the volume of transactions that has come through with regards to e-levy. Definitely, the volume of transactions have come down comparatively year on year, month on month, uh, after the introduction of the, of the uh, uh, policy by the government. Our job is to make sure that we'll still be able to stimulate customer transactions so that e-levy doesn't cripple the digital space. A lot of our members are moving into digital loans and what have you. And if there's a, a disincentive for clients to use the digital platforms, then definitely to affect the volumes and the growth that we talked about earlier on. So yes, we've seen some slowdown of transactions on the digital platforms, but our hope is that as we encourage, as we stimulate um, our members, and we also... Um, uh, make sure we educate our clients on the need to use digital platforms to reduce transaction costs and increase transaction volumes. It will, it will be a byproduct of the volumes that we expect in the long run. Second Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Elsie Addo Awaji, who launched a code of ethics and conduct to regulate the association and the industry as a whole, highlighted the urgency with which the association must venture into more digital means of operating. She pledged the central bank's commitment to see to the success of this call. The Bank of Ghana has augmented the risk management framework for banks and SDIs in tandem with this increase we see. So our rules on cyber security, cyber and information security, which is currently under review, our enhanced AML CFT rules, our enhanced consumer protection rules are all part of our efforts to ensure that you can safely deploy technology to be able to compete effectively at the same time mitigating the risks that come with it. We will, at the Bank of Ghana, will continue to monitor the rapid evolution of, of the digital financial services and recalibrate our rules and supervisory approaches to mitigate these risks that we see, however, enabling 
the exploitation of the benefits, the immense benefits that this phenomenon presents to our entire financial system and our economy as a whole. The Ghana Association of Savings and Loans Companies at the AGM swore in newly elected board members to run the association for the next two years. Chairman of the board is the CEO of Opportunity International Savings and Loans, Kwame Ousu Boating, with the managing director of Advanced Ghana Savings and Loans, Oliver Balibechet, as his vice. Other board members include Lydia Dadi, Anod Parker, Yusuf Abubakari, and Mohamed Eronjeb. The value of losses recorded as a result of fraud in banks and the specialized deposit-taking institutions in Ghana in 2021 witnessed a significant jump of 144% increase from the previous year. The figure rose to 61 million Ghana cities from 25 million in 2020. The year 2021 showed a minimal decline of 12.09% in the number of attempted fraud cases of 2,347 for the banking and SDI sector as compared to 2,670 in 2020. However, the year 2021 recorded a loss value of 61 million Ghana cities as compared to a loss of 25 million Ghana cities in 2020, representing a 144% increase in year-on-year -year terms. The significant fraud types that accounted for this figure included ATM, card or POS fraud, impersonation, lending and credit fraud, forgery and manipulation of documents, cash suppression and e-money fraud. ATM card and POS related fraud recorded the highest loss of 22 million Ghana CDs. This can be attributed to negligence of some customers and weak systems of some financial institutions. Another significant fraud type was impersonation, which recorded a loss of 10 million Ghana CDs. This loss can be attributed to a lack of due diligence on the part of bank staff and customers of financial institutions when carrying out transactions. Staff involvement in fraud, which constitutes 53.46% of total fraud cases, continue to increase in the year under review. The electronic money issuers, EMI sector, reported a significant number of mobile money, Momo fraud incidents and loss values in 2021. EMI has recorded 12,350 Momo-related fraud incidents in 2021. The total e-money-related loss recorded by EMIs in 2021 amounted to approximately 12.8 million Ghana CDs. As part of efforts to reduce the number of fraud-related cases and the value of losses associated with fraud, the central bank has recommended, among other things, that banks and specialized depositing institutions should take a critical look at their control measures for lending. The central bank also added that banks and SDIs should adequately provide education and sensitize their customers at the stage of signing onto their electronic and digital products. Let's talk about the Ghana card. The deadline for owners of bank accounts to update their bank details with the card has elapsed. But not everyone has been able to access the card to undergo the process. The question is, what happens to them? Some Ghanaians expressed mixed reactions to the directive of the Bank of Ghana for all licensed and regulated financial institutions under the central bank to accept only the Ghana card for transactions from July 1, 2022. Per the notice from the central bank, the move is in furtherance of the central bank's objective of ensuring the safety of the financial ecosystem. According to the notice of the Bank of Ghana, institutions that will be required to accept only the Ghana card for financial transactions include banks, specialized deposit taking institutions, non-deposit taking financial institutions, payment service providers and dedicated electronic money issuers, forex bureaus and credit reference bureaus. While multiple stakeholders in Ghana's banking industry welcome the move by the Bank of Ghana, saying it will check fraud and sanitize the country's financial system, others were somewhat skeptical and concerned about the fate of their hard-earned funds, especially as some were struggling to procure the Ghana card. So, will persons without the Ghana card lose their accounts from tomorrow? And what about individuals who have the card but haven't updated their records? Some customers have been speaking to City Business News. I'll find time to go do that, but then I'll plead with the government to extend it because 1st July, how many people have heard about it in the first place? And most of all, too, if we don't get it done by 1st July, what does it mean? Does it mean the government is going to freeze our accounts or what? Since I don't have my, I don't know where I'm going to get it. 
So if the extended a date maybe um I guess it's not bad. Yes. So that we can also prepare and get it. Let's ask ourselves as a people that how many Ghanaians are even having their Ghana card with them. So are we doing this um at the detriment of others? Because not everyone is having his Ghana card. So what's the alternative for those who are not having their Ghana cards? Are we saying that the birth sets, the voters ID and all the rest of the rest of the identification cards are not necessary? So we need to define why we are so bent to use the Ghana card. It started in the government, it ended. Are we saying that there's not going to be an alternative card going forward? So we should sit down as a country and then plan the way forward than to be in a rush. Johnny Wa is the CEO of the Ghana Bankers Association and he assures that with or without the Ghana card, Ghanaians will still be able to undertake banking transactions. If you have Ghana card, and for one reason or the other, you have not been able to update your records, um, you don't have to worry. At the point, uh, whenever you decide to execute a transaction and you produce your Ghana card or you know the, the off, off, offline verification of your Ghana card, at that stage, your bank can update your records. So you should be able to transact. Even in situations where you don't have the Ghana card and for some reason it is impossible for you to get now, Maybe you are offshore and there's no registration center offshore, and we all know that. You will continue undertaking your banking transactions in the same manner as you used to um, execute banking transactions um, um, in, in present regime, except that perhaps the bank may ask you some more questions because the account profile would have changed and some level of enhanced due diligence will be undertaken by the bank. But account remains your account, whether you have a Ghana card or not. Um, the money in the account remains your money, and therefore, the um, bank will not stop you from having access. He meanwhile urged Ghanaians to take the needed steps to get their Ghana cards if they haven't, and update their records to ensure their funds receive an extra layer of protection. For whatever reason, it can be, and there are some people who are presently indisposed, uh, for which reason they may not be able to go for Ghana card, and um, you know, you cannot delegitimize their banking transactions. The point is your bank may ask for more questions. They may ask you more questions as to why you don't have the Ghana card and, and will advise you that you know on your next transaction, try and come up with your Ghana card so that your records will be updated. It's in our own interest because of the extra security features that the Ghana card has, which really will go a long way towards ensuring the safety and sanctity of banking transactions. The issue of access to dollars for the importation of fuel has become crucial for a while now as the price of the product skyrockets both globally and at the pumps. The Bank of Ghana had made some efforts to manage the situation, but it does not seem to be enough. The Ghana Chamber of Boko Distributors believes players in the foreign exchange market should do more to augment the efforts of the BOG. The bulk distributing companies are licensed to import crude oil and finished products, store and distribute to oil marketing companies, among other functions. For a long time, the BDCs were struggling to get access to enough foreign exchange at affordable rates to procure their products, a situation that led to some level of uneasiness within the industry. In an attempt to resolve the issue of a lack of US dollars for the BDCs, whose work influences the final price of fuel at the pumps, the Bank of Ghana earlier this year introduced a foreign exchange forward auction program for the BDCs. And despite the success of the intervention, the quantum of dollars supplied by the central bank, according to the CEO of the Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors, Senor Hussi, has been dropping alarmingly over the past few months. The BOG has actually reduced the quantum of its uh, intervention in real terms and also in ratio terms relative to requirements. Um, when we started, the first window was 114 then they did another 100. So it means that for the first month of April, $214 million was made available to our market. Then the next month, from the 214, it came down to, I think, uh, 125. And from 125, which was in uh, May, I think in June, what we are seeing now is just a hundred million. Cumulatively, 
their intervention has been um, forty percent of of the requirements that had been had been uh, has been uh, submitted. But if you look at that on a month on a month uh, basis, um, we have seen a very significant drop from a window that started with eighty five percent then to 50% and now we are 21%. Mr. Hossi thus highlighted the need for other players in the open FX market like the commercial banks to support the efforts of the Bank of Ghana in the supply of foreign exchange for players that need it in the local petroleum industry. The Minister of Trade and Industry, Alan Tremating, is calling on the Bank of Ghana and the Ministry of Finance to establish a loan guarantee scheme that will offer liquidity to support the growth and sustainability of micro, small and medium enterprises in the country. He was speaking at the launch of 67 business resource centers established by his ministry under the Rural Enterprise Program. With funding from the African Development Bank and the International Fund for Agricultural Development, the Ministry of Trade and Industry under the Rural Enterprise Program has established 67 business resource centers with the aim of providing quality direct implementation support for micro, small and medium-sized enterprises in the country. The core services provided by the centers include business opportunity identification, business plan preparation, facilitation of access to finance, business diagnostics and training and management and entrepreneurship amongst others. Currently, there are 30 centers under construction and 37 in operation across selected districts in the country. Speaking at the launch of the Business Resource Centers in Accra, Minister of Trade and Industry, Alan Trombanting, urged the Bank of Ghana and the Ministry of Finance to establish a loan guarantee scheme that would offer liquidity to support the growth and sustainability of micro, small and medium-sized enterprises in the country. Already the evidence is clear. 80% of employment generated in this country comes from micro, small, and medium enterprises. So all you need is to do more and provide more support to the MSME sector. And then we'll start making a headway with dealing with the challenge of unemployment. You know that the lifeblood of every business is money. So again, I want to use this platform Yes, I'm part of government, but I'm making an appeal to government, to myself, and to my government. The Ministry of Finance working together. I see my younger brother here, the Deputy Minister of uh, Finance here. Let the Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank, the Bank of Ghana, put together a loan guarantee scheme that will release the liquidity in the banks to support the development of micro, small and medium enterprises. Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Enterprises Agency, Kusi Yanki Aye, described the business resource centers as huge assets for the nation's growth and development. She explained that the country's industrialization agenda has received a major boost with the establishment of the 67 business resource centers across the country. In partnership with the business resource centers, we will ensure that the MSMEs of this nation have the tools, have the resources to be able to build and move forward. In the past three years, under your direction and leadership, the interventions such as the Coronavirus Alleviation Program Business Support Scheme, the Recovery and Resilience Program, the GET Ghana Economic Transformation Projects has transformed the lives of over 300,000 MSMEs across the nation. Majority of them have received support from the leadership of the Ministry of Trade and Industry to provide the needed resources by facilitating access to finance, access to technical support to build the MSMEs of this nation. Minister, as we move forward, there's more ahead. You may work with us, you talk through us on the business resource centers and the need for them to go out and support new MSMEs. In a month, over 100 million Ghana cities under your leadership would be supported MSMEs to build them so that the agenda of industrializing the various districts in the nation will come to pass. Ladies and gentlemen, the BRCs are a huge asset for GEA and for this nation. 
It has come at the right time. City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363. On Go TV, access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free to air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. Over 1,200 jobs will be created soon in the central region with the reopening of an organic juice processing factory in Asibu. This is due to the efforts of the GIZ in partnership with the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation through its Invest for Job program, which will move the factory's initial production capacity of 25% to 70%. The Costa Groups Limited. A wholly owned Ghanaian organic juice processing factory has been dormant for over 14 years. According to residents of Asebu in the central region where the factory is located, the inability of the factory to function has denied, particularly the youth of the community, the opportunity to decent jobs. The dormant nature of the factory prompted the German corporation, GIZ, together with the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, to come to the aid of the community by saying to it that the factory was made to function. According to the head of sustainable economic development at GIZ, Gerard Gokoski, the ability of the factory to function is important since it has high impact on employment, market opportunities, environmental sustainability, and above all, improve the business ecosystem. The agricultural sector in Ghana is noted to serve as a primary source of employment, livelihood, food security for most rural folks and it accounts for one-fifth of the country's GDP and employs nearly half of its labor force. The head of sustainable economic development at GIZ believes revamping the juice factory has the potential to reduce rural urban migration and also create jobs in the rural areas. In the central region, we have some projects um, that are also supported in the central region. But uh, from this Invest for Jobs initiative, it's the first one. Right? And uh, for us, it's important to also target uh, the rural areas. And uh, um, the, the objective is always job creation. And we think we, it's very important to create also jobs in the rural areas to avoid overcrowding in Accra. We've, um, you know, we've provided a grant to them and also uh, we have another, we call it subsidy. And with this, uh, we are supporting it to get the whole factory going again. That's our vision. And um, otherwise, we would not have invested in this. So, yeah, we have um, quite a lot of areas. So we are not only focusing on certain areas, but um, of course, the strong element is uh, the area of agro-processing okay. because um, yeah, quite a big part of the population is living in rural areas and uh, it's of course agriculture and um, we see also a lot of potential in further processing of fruit, vegetables, etc. in Ghana. The managing director of the company, Daniel Dangwa, says revamping the factory will increase employment in the enclave as the over 162 employees who were laid off will be brought back. Additionally, the factory will employ over 3,000 outgrowers to support with raw materials. When we start, we will bring back the 162 employees we originally hired. That was, um, that did not include the cassava project because the cassava project started 
the cassava project started about four years ago. So if I do my calculations right, the cassava will also take about 70 additional employees. So within the first year, we hope to have minimum 230 employees here. The agroers will also go up from the 3,000 to probably about 3,500. I want us to do this right, uh, use all the raw materials to do something and have others copy from us. The National Home Ownership Fund has, since its inception, facilitated the construction of over 400 homes in the country. This comes at a time where Ghana is battling with a growing housing deficit of almost 2 million. Hopefully, the fund will be able to increase the number of homes significantly in the coming years to improve the housing situation in Ghana. To address the country's growing housing deficit, the National Home Ownership Fund was established in 2018 to tackle the two main constraints to home ownership of Ghanaians. These are access to mortgages to buy homes by low to medium income earners and the high cost of financing for the construction of residential homes. In an interview with City Business News on the sidelines of a housing fair organized by the Ghana Education Service, Managing Director of the National Home Ownership Fund, Dela Zumenu, called for more private sector partnerships to improve the housing situation in the country. We've done close to 420 mortgages through our partnership banks. You know, the National Home Ownership Fund does not directly deal with developers or deal with home buyers. We are a fund set up by government to create incentives for banks to lend at a very cheap rate, normally below the market rate. We use what we call the blended financing concept. What that concept does is that government makes funding available to our participating financial institutions at concessionary rates. It is matched by these banks at their market rate and we arrive at what we call the blended rate, which is almost all the time lower or even half the market rate based on which the banks are able to lend at those rates which are cheaper and below the market rate. We also do, through the same banks, we are able to also make sure that we extend some funding to construction so that the construction companies can also produce homes that are affordable so that we can match you know, the demand and the supply. Speaking on the sidelines of the same event, Director General of the Ghana Education Service, Professor Kwesi Opokwa Mankwa, called on the public to get adequate information on owning a home, especially as there are cost concerns about such an enterprise. That is why we brought the experts here. And a lot of time, we don't even have the information, but we assume that high, it's high cost. But they look at how much you earn, if you have any extra beyond this, they would take you through the processes and make sure that at least you can start something, you know. Fortunately for us, we also have the National Home Ownership Fund, which is a fund set up under the Ministry of Finance. It's a government fund, which is set up under the Ministry of Finance, who is ready to support government workers to own a house. So, um, there is high hopes, and we assume that I mean, mortgages are high and things like that. But I believe that if you have about 20 years to, as I said, you have about 20 years to work and you work out the details properly, you obviously get there. Infrastructure like transportation on the continent is central to promoting the African continental free trade area. This is why the AFTA Secretariat is calling on various governments in Africa to accelerate development in such areas to fast-track trade under the agreement. The African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat at the Ghana Trade Roadshow admonished African countries to emulate some of the measures that other countries in the continent are showcasing in terms of improved transport infrastructure to boost intra-African trade.
According to the Secretary General of the Secretariat, Wamkele Mene, improving key infrastructure on the continent will go a long way into making the AFTA a success. He was speaking under the theme, supporting the Africa trade agenda, ensuring the last mile. From uh, Abidjan to, uh, to Lagos, it will take 12, 15, 16 days. And even if you move your goods from Accra to Lagos, it will take about 10, 12 days. 37 checkpoints, 37 official checkpoints along the corridor. And now, these 37 checkpoints and these this 12 days is a cost to doing business. Let's contrast that with um, East Africa. You can move your goods from the port of Mombasa to Kampala in three days, a distance of 1,600 kilometers. They reduced the transit time over a 10-year period from 15 days, 28 stamps, to three days and one step. This is a demonstration of what we can do as Africans when we focus our minds and we ensure that we are committed to getting things done. That corridor is now probably one of the most efficient in Africa. So it is not about competi competition between corridors. It's about competitiveness of trade in Africa and the cost and the ease of doing business in Africa. Herbert Krapa, a Deputy Minister for Trade and Industry, highlighted the importance for Ghana to maintain a collaboration with the AFTA Secretariat to benefit from the continent-wide pact. I used the example of the automotive industry to highlight the sad but promising reality of the African story. Although Africa is endowed with natural resources to manufacture nearly all 30,000 components of the vehicle, only three out of the 55, Morocco, South Africa, and Egypt are vehicle manufacturers. If this does not frighten us, I don't know what would. We can no longer remain exporters of the very raw materials whose finished products rule the global economy. As host of the Secretariat and an ever dependable champion of Africa's integration agenda, we in Ghana will continue to take very seriously our collaborative role with the AFCFTA Secretariat. We have set up a national coordination office to spearhead the coordinated efforts of the multiple institutions needed for successful implementation. The Ghana Trade Road Show was organized by Afrexim Bank in partnership with Oakwood Green Africa Limited, Ghana Free Zones Authority, the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, and the AFTA Secretariat. One of the major challenges of the agricultural sector is access to funding mainly because banks and financial institutions are particular about such ventures due to the risk involved. But Sector Minister Dr. Efri Yakuto believes such institutions must do more to help the sector grow. He made the remarks at the launch of the Agricultural Stakeholder Convening Platform by Gesau in Accra. The Ghana Incentive-Based Risk Sharing System for Agricultural Lending Project, GESAL, which is a non-banking financial institution established to de-risk agricultural financing and stimulate increased lending to the agricultural sector, designed the Agriculture Stakeholder Convening and Advocacy Platform to help resolve agricultural challenges and provide sustainable solutions. The platform has been developed to facilitate sustainable dialogue among all stakeholders, address the sector's bottlenecks, ensure institutional enforcement of standards and regulations, and affect changes in the incoherent policies and multiplication of efforts impacting the sector's productivity and competitiveness. Inadequate financing is one of the key issues affecting the sector. Despite the improvement in credits to the private sector in the past few months as economic activity picks up, the agricultural sector, in addition to forestry, and fishing continues to receive one of the lowest levels of credit from banks in the country, receiving only 3.5% of credit.
credit to the private sector as at April 2022. The same report shows that the services sector received the biggest chunk of credits given out by banks at 33.4%, a significant jump from 29.4% in April last year. Speaking on the fortunes of the sector going forward in his address at the launch of the Agriculture Stakeholder Convening and Advocacy Platform by Gesau in Accra on June 29, 2022, Dr. Usufi Akuto, the Agriculture Minister, once again bemoaned the low level of support for the sector and stated that if banks cannot be convinced to lend more to the agriculture sector, legislation will be used to get them to do so. Through planting for food and jobs, government at least on two issues, seed and fertilizer. In the five years, the government of Akufuado has had to take away from the taxpayer 2.6 billion Ghana cities to subsidize seed and fertilizer to our farmers as a way to increase productivity. The farmers have been disappointed. They produce goods worth nearly 50 billion out of the two and a half billion the government has invested in them. That is our calculation. But then there should be a partnership with the private sector, with the commercial banks, and that is not happening. And you know, because of the lack of responses that we are getting from the, the commercial banks, Hello? I'm preparing Hello? a cabinet memo for cabinet to consider legislation wow. for agricultural credit in this country. I know from my work in India myself 20, 30 years ago and other Asian countries that this legislation exists where for every 100 cities of uh, credit given out by any commercial bank, 20 cities in the case of India has to be in the agricultural area. So we are preparing this because if persuasion fails, then we have to legislate as a government. That's our responsibility. And we see that as the biggest challenge, standing here as the Minister for Food and Agriculture, as the biggest challenge to the march towards transforming our agriculture. The banks should come on board. On his part, the Minister of Finance, Ken Ferrata, added that financing alone will not solve the problems within the country's agriculture sector. He called on stakeholders to ensure that there is a more enabling environment to support the sector's growth. But finance alone will not get the job done. Without the right policies, policy coherence, and an enabling regulatory environment that make agribusiness profitable in Ghana, banks and private investors will continue to be reluctant to put their money in the sector. This is why today we are here to witness the evolution of Gessel from just a risk-sharing guarantee and technical entity to include as part of its activities a facilitating, facilitating role in bringing together key actors in the sector to work together to create an environment that strongly supports the transformation of the agri sector. Still in the agricultural sector and to the City Business Festival. The final week of the festival focused on agribusiness and we have put together highlights of the forum on the subject rediscovering the agribusiness goldmine held earlier in the week. The forum on the theme of rediscovering the agribusiness goldmine had panelists from the financial sector, academia and the agricultural sector. A critical point that ran through the conversation was the need for collaboration from all state actors linked to the agricultural sector to maximize efforts to harness opportunities that exist. Chrissy Kobo is the CEO of Gesau. It works, you need road network, you need communication, you need water reporting systems, you need research, exactly. you need health. Exactly. Okay? Uh, you, I mean, the various, look, let me give you an example. We bring in a lot of agriculture products. We know countries in the normal times would find, any, find ways to help producers export these things and the various export subsidy exactly. regimes and so forth. We have in this country the Ghana International Trade Commission, which always look at issues of anti dumping and so forth. How would we be using them? Exactly. So they all have an impact on the sector. Mm -hmm. And unless, I said, we have a holistic yeah. approach, mm -hmm. and we should be clamoring for that as agriculturists, that how do we coordinate? 
how do you ensure there's coherence? Exactly. That road, if road is in a road in a certain area where we, we agree that this is a designated area for this value chain, how do you ensure that road network goes there? Hmm. The issue of a lack of interest of the youth in the agricultural sector remains a crucial matter of concern. Chief Executive Officer of Eden Tree, Catherine Krobo Eduse, is convinced the narrative must change. If you grow up with your parents mm. and they are farmers and they've been using cutlass and hoe, would you be interested to do the same thing? No, especially when you have gone to school. Yes. You're not going to go to school, go to university, and want to come back exactly. and use cutlass and hoe. Mm. There's no way. Yes. So let us design modern demonstration farms, you know, you. irrigation, mm. yes. drones, okay, uh, tractors, exactly. small implements, exactly. planters, Thank you know, you. we can't have women with children on their backs still yes. planting yes. into their mm. holes. Mm -hmm. Take carrots for instance, carrot is a difficult crop to cultivate, the seeds are tiny exactly. and the crop goes, grows into the ground. So when you are planting manually, you need to figure out the uh, amount of space yes. that you leave for the carrot to be able to grow. Addressing the issue of financing for the sector, the head of agribusiness at APSA Bank, William Nete, believes there ought to be innovative ways of tackling such issues. Are we able to put these farmers together in, in groups? We do yeah. that when there's a project, and the money comes to them, they farm, and then once the project is off, the groups collapse, and that is it. Mm. Are we able, through the various Ministries. I know the Ministry of Food and Agriculture is doing some work to put groups together. But beyond the groups, are they able even to become an association? Are they able to become a force? And you, you hear you know, some of them talk as groups. But really on the ground, are we able to, to do that? And if you are able to do that, then you have these groups that can, that can approach a financial institution. How many of these groups can approach a financial institution based on their balance sheet, based on what they've been able to achieve? All they do is that, come and give us money. You, you go there, it, it becomes a challenge. So we need to fix that. Hmm. And, and gradually, like has been said, shift from the smallholder farmers into uh, uh, larger farms. Despite the challenges in the sector, are there opportunities to take advantage of? Yes, the opportunities are we have, for example, mm. maize, soya bean, and then uh, rice. Mm. These are top-notch crops that respond to external inputs. That is, you use the right, uh, right varieties, mm. targeting at the right ecology, also looking at the uh, input requirements in that range. For example, maize. We produce maize varieties and hybrids mm. more than any other African crop country in the West Africa. Wow. Yes. And we've won awards under this, uh, under this bill and uh, for best breeding and also dissemination. Mm. These are climate smart varieties. I'm sure you're aware this year's edition of the City Business Festival is mainly sponsored by APSA Bank with support from MTN Momo and MTN Business, IT Consortium, the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, and GESA. But finally on the festival, and the much talked about City Summit came off also as speakers who took their turns to speak on the topic, the effects of global economic conditions on sub-Saharan African countries. Here are excerpts of the event. The topic for the summit is crucial as African countries continue to suffer from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and more recently the Russia-Ukraine war. These two events have had a devastating impact on the economies of countries on the continent. In Ghana, for instance, this has led to inflation hitting a record high coupled with concerns about food security as inputs for some staple foods are sourced from Russia and Ukraine. Speaking at City TV and ESA's City Summit, Chief Economist at APSA Bank, Jeff Gable, stressed that for African governments to actively tackle the issue of inflation, there must be a critical review of subsidies. We only look here in, in the region towards one of the giants like Nigeria to see that almost all of the federal government's revenues right now, almost all, are not being set aside to pay for 
new hospitals or schools or to run a more efficient public service or to generate roads and, and energy infrastructure, all the things that make for a smoothly functioning competitive business environment. It's just used to subsidize petrol. That's astonishing, right? Absolutely astonishing. But those forces are, are here, right? As an economist, we find that kind of subsidy in some ways uh, a little bit uh, counterproductive, right? Prices are high because the demand for the product is very substantial and the supply is more limited. One of the ways you bring prices down is by demanding less of it. How do you demand less of it? Well, at some point you say, you know what? This weekend, kids, we're staying at home. <laughs> we're not driving to the countryside. If you subsidize fuel, you jump in the car, you have a moan, but away you go. Taking his turn at the event, the director of the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, ISE, at the University of Ghana, Professor Peter Kwoti, shared some policy measures he believed could help manage the economic challenges in the country. There are some options, policy options that I, I propose. That is fiscal consolidation, aggressively mobilizing re uh, revenue through tax and non-tax measures. I always cite the case of property rates. If you look at property values that we see at the banks, I I'm sure um, Abena will bear witness. The property values people bring, the collaterals they bring to borrow. And we, I mean, if you aggregate them just for one bank, and look at the property rates we collect um, for a year, it's 468 million cities. But the average house can be 3 million, 6 million, etc. I think we can do more with property rates. Um, also, um, digitalization is very critical in raising revenue. Nobody wants to pay tax um, right from the days of um, Jesus. Uh, Matthew, nobody liked Matthew. <laughs> um, so, but you have to pay. Zacchaeus, um, a tax collector, nobody like. But you have to make effort, make tax payments easy, that I can go online, file my taxes, and pay. David Ofosu Dorte, senior partner at ABN David Law Firm, stressed the need to leverage crisis to improve the fortunes of the continent. Now, crisis come in several forms. So let's look at the recent one we had, like COVID-19. The point about getting out of crisis is very simple. First, maintain the status quo. Just make sure you don't get worse off. Second, do everything to prevent deterioration. And I want us to measure every African country to measure with their own yardstick whether this is what we did. This is my yardstick. I may be wrong, but at least I do have a yardstick. After more than four hours of intensive and insightful discussion, some participants shared their experiences. My major takeaway is uh, I think uh, they've done well to, you know, talk about the problems of Ghanaians and uh, some solutions prescribed. And, and that's, uh, but I'm, I want to see the practicality of it, the, how practical our solutions would be you know, to bring it down. One of the panelists mentioned that we educated people seem to make certain simple things too complicated. Let us bring it down. Let us find a Ghanaian solution. I think uh, this is the kind of conversation we should have as a country with regards to where the nation is heading towards. We know that inflation is uh, around 27.6%, with that which is a disturbing situation for businesses across the country. So this program is indeed well positioned to enlighten individuals, because we saw students, we saw experts, we saw government agency representatives who were there to understand why we are where we are. Well, it's a wrap for this week's edition of the Business Weekly Show here on City TV, your most watched business show in the country. And for more business stories, check out our website, citybusinessnews.com. And don't miss out on the business dashboard, which airs on City TV at 10 p.m. sharp every weekday with a repeat the following day at 7 and 10.30 a.m. My name is Michael Obodu. Thank you for watching. Please follow me on Twitter at M Obodu. Catch you same time next week. Stay safe, stay informed. Bye-bye. Uh, uh.